طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Studying the Quran is no doubt uh, the most noble study that anyone can embark upon uh, because we have a whole history of prophets and revelation in the world and this is the only access that anyone has to an actual preserved original document that was the words of God sent to mankind. So it's important for us to do everything we can. A lot of uh, Muslims who aren't from an Arabic background or um, you know, have grown older and have, would have a very hard time uh, to learn the Arabic language often feel like they're put in a position to uh, feel just like they have guilt. Like, I didn't learn the language of the Qur'an. Um, but you can always study the tafsir. You can study uh, a detailed analysis that goes deep into the meanings of the Qur'an according to all of the scholars of tafsir. So that's inshallah what we're going to do today. Today we'll be studying the 26th and 27th verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. And Surah Al-Baqarah is this huge, vast uh, legacy of understanding guidance in terms of the Israelites were this chosen, preferred nation of all of nations of the earth. And so that's the other side of the Abrahamic lineage through Isaac and Jacob. This is the Israelites. So Ishmael did not have the legacy of many prophets. He was blessed with the final prophet the seal of the prophets on his side. So in this revelation, Baqarah begins by answering the guidance question that we are asking in the Fatiha every single day. That this is the guidance. Here it is. And so it starts with a whole analysis of faith, disbelief, hypocrisy, divine connection, servitude, devotion, the law, the spirit of the law, the purpose of the law, um, the need for a holistic system of life that is revolving around uh, the divine. And so now here uh, is going to begin a kind of um, attitude approach. How do we look at the Qur'an? If I'm a believer in the Qur'an, what is my attitude? And what is the Qur'an in relationship to other Arabic? And what is the reality of one who engages the Qur'an who is disbelieving in it. So this is the first verse. It says, if you don't have uh, an app or something, you, you should probably get one. If you need a mushaf, we can get one for you. Has everybody got, you know, everybody following it, Allah? So it says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي أَنْ يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا so the beginning of this verse, it says in what means, Indeed, God is not ashamed to give a parable of something as small as a gnat or even smaller. So somebody who's reading this might uh, ask, why is this? This verse, you must have to see it. Otherwise, you'd be like, what is that? You would not know why is it saying that. It would not mean much to you. And so... The first thing that we get is that um, what Allah is saying in this verse is إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ It's in another verse like that. God is not ashamed to say the truth. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَسْتَحِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ So that is the first thing that we learn. If that's the nature of God, that He's not shy or ashamed of saying truth, where are we? No matter what people are saying to us or trying to make us feel like, if we say the truth, and we say the truth in the way that truth should be said, which is according to the revelation, according to the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet nothing should stop us. Nothing should stop us. Now if you're saying, so if you're saying that, if you're claiming to be saying the truth, and it's causing all kinds of conflict with everybody who encounters it, there's something wrong with you, not the revelation, right? So this is the first lesson that we learned from this one. And then the next part he says, يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا You know what يَضْرِب means? Here's an interesting point. Because this becomes controversial in Surah An-Nisa, right? Do you know in Arabic, if I go like this, أَضْرِبَ الطَّاوِلًا 
I'm hitting it. Darb. Right? That's darb. Right? Now, if I took a sledgehammer and smashed this thing into small pieces, that's also called darb. Right? They're equally called to hit. Right? So, obviously, here it doesn't refer to hit. What is it referring to? To strike a parable. To make a parable. We say strike a parable. So what is a parable? Methala. The word method means something that's like something. So a parable is an example that will help you to understand another example. So you're having a hard time understanding a reality. So you give some sort of explanation with some other uh, thing that may be easier to understand for the person who's trying to gather or grasp the depth of this particular thing. So that's called darb al to give examples. So what does darb mean here? It means to move someone to think, to influence them to grasp and understand something. It means to form an opinion or a reality in someone. That's darb. The Arabs were known for giving parables. But they had this, they were uh, accustomed to giving parables in big things. Like what? Who could tell me what is famous classical Arabic? What kind of examples they would give? The mountains, the skies, the ocean, the moon, the sun, the river, the valley. Right? This is how Arabs would make points, big things. So the commentators on the Qur'an, they said that what Allah is doing here is responding to some other verses that were revealed in Mecca. Because this Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed, revealed where? In Medina. It is revealed in Medina. Uh, the way you can distinguish between the two is the verses revealed in Mecca are generally focusing on clarity of belief, who is God? What is His nature? What is spirituality? The hereafter? Character development? A general idea of prophethood and the need thereof? Clarifying the corruption of basic, basic evils like oppression and things like that? You're going to find that in the Meccan verses. The Medina verses are going to talk in great detail about the system of the religion, the law. Um, clarifying detailed analyses of uh, the people of the book as it related to the life of the Prophet ﷺ, rather than a general idea about their history and things like that, as, as was the verses in Mecca. So in, who can tell me some small things that Allah has made an example of in the Qur'an? Again. Ant, Ant. Spider. spider, Dubab. A fly, right? Those were some beautiful linguistic parables nobody would doubt. But it went against the grain of the Arabic poetry. So the people had defined eloquence as it must be using big examples. You can't use small little examples because that's some sort of weakness in your linguistics. So Allah is saying, I can do whatever I want. Well, somebody might try to bring the philosophical or theological concern that the Qur'an was coming to change or to challenge the reality of the Arabs. To show that this is pure and Qur'an un mubin, a clear Arabic Qur'an. That's what it says about itself. So, Allah is saying, listen to the language and judge the actual presentation of concepts and the reality of the linguistic makeup. Don't force some ancestral usage as this is the only way it should be done. So Allah is actually teaching us a lesson that I am sending this final message to you in your own tongue. But this message is not bound by culture. Isn't that an interesting thing we're extracting here? 
he's actually making that point. That the message can be eloquent and pure and perfect and exalted. But it is uh, not bound by whatever your poets have said, these are the limits. You can bring it in any way you like, however you want to make your point. Some of the uh, scholars have said that when it says, فَمَا فَوْقَهَا That would give you the idea something above the fly or the gnat. But the majority said, no, it's like dunaha, Something even lesser than it. Meaning, فَوْقَهَا فِي Even more smaller than it. Right? Because the point is being made that you cannot set a limit on what kind of thing I can make an example out of. The language is the language. Assess the actual presentation of the concept. So speaking with wisdom and challenging cultural tendencies with truth and wisdom is a sunnah. You see that? Challenging certain cultural tendencies but understanding the way of the tongue of the people is a sunnah. So like right now, people in our society have decided certain things about the norm when it comes to modesty or chastity or uh, how you make wealth or how you... So people would make you feel uncomfortable to present a strong, rational, moral case for the Islamic model of economy or the Islamic model of modesty and chastity, right? Should we be like, well, I don't want to offend the culture, and so I'm not going to say anything. Inna allaha la yastahi. Right? So he's telling us, how is the divine guidance, the, the words of truth, is saying, do not be shy to say the truth. Similarly, our scholars have said, la uh, hayat fi deen. Uh, you know what that means? Some people misunderstand that. I remember one time the Sheikh said it in, uh, in Kuwait. And uh, one of the brothers said, Kaif ya Sheikh. Because it sounds like you're saying there's no shame in the religion. No, he means fi umur ad deen, fi su'al an ad deen. You cannot be shy to ask questions about the religion. You should never say, you know, Oh, well, I'm not going to ask about that because then it may look like or something like that. If you feel like it needs to be asked in private for your own personal comfort, that's fine. But don't not answer, ask the question. Mm -hmm. Right? And we need to be clear. And we saw in the early times, in the great scholars, that they would talk about things. Even in mixed gatherings, some narration, you have it, that women would ask freely the Prophet ﷺ about things specific to women. And he would not mind about that. Mm -hmm. And they would not... They, so, so one of the narrators said the Meccan women are different from the women from Medina. Did it say, and these are evil and these are right? No, it said they're different. Meaning what? The prophetic legacy is to respect everybody where they're at. And then once it's been confirmed that that's acceptable behavior by the Prophet then it's acceptable behavior. So that's what it says. The next one says, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ as for those who believe, they will know that this is the truth from their Lord. So the believer who is looking for guidance. How many of you have heard of the concept of uh, Mustashiq? Mustashiq is an Orientalist. How about the term Orientalist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are Europeans who deem themselves as the white privilege thing, European history. You know, they deem themselves as greater civilized people, and so let's study those strange Eastern folks. So Orient is referring to the East, Orientalism to study those. So in Islam, this is basically studying Islamic history and picking it apart according to the ways of the European thought. So they have read lots of Quran, lots of Hadith, but their intention is not looking for guidance, right? And, you know, I'm not trying to... It's, it may seem that I'm, I'm being blinded by my faith. But I happen to be one of those people who study religion objectively. It's a, 
It's a new thing. And I get chastised for it when I challenge Muslims to do this because if you're really looking for true certainty and faith, you should do it. You should be Salman al Farisi if you really want to embrace it, right? So the believers, they're saying, I'm looking for truth. I want to know God. I want to know what the purpose of life is. I want to know what's going to happen to me when I die. These are the questions. Everybody asks them in their life. Atheists have asked them, they try to hide them. And then they come up with interesting answers about it and how they claim, oh, I'm perfectly cool with everything. I just know I'm going to die and become dust and that's it. I'm happy with that. You know, deep down, they are deeply struggling with this because it's against the fitrah. It's against the nature of the human being. So the believer is looking for it. They will see, they will know that this is the truth from their Lord. Lord here, Rabb, creator, provider, sustainer, maintainer. This is, when you say Rabb, these are the four qualities and characteristics. It's basically God's way of emphasizing the, the concept of Father without using the term Father because of what the Christian community have done with a historical Jewish mechanism to refer to great prophets and respected leaders. If you go in the Old Testament, you'll find it. The Son of God. But no Jew historically understood that as like some literal theological like divine entity like demigod or God on earth type thing because that's blasphemy historically. Christianity has made that like standard. So God made it very clear through the scripture and through the history of the prophetic model that you should not use this term. Now, let's just so that we understand this point very clear. If somebody challenged you, aren't we all like the children of God? You could say, yeah, like the children of God, no problem. He created us, provides for us, sustains us. He's doing all of that. But we are not literally God's children, meaning we have His DNA. We are flawed and finite and go through fluctuation. He is pure and perfect and constant and absolute. Those are vastly different. They can never be compared. There's nothing like him, but at the same time, he hears and sees everything. Does that mean he has eyes and ears? For sure, these are not eyes and ears because he is not like any of us, right? So, uh, so the believers are looking for the guidance. And so they will find it in the Quran. So here's one of the things at the beginning it says, Hudal uh, Muttaqeen, right? There's something in Islamic theology called mafhum al-mukhalafa. So if it's guidance for those who are trying to be mindful of God and purpose, then it will be what for those who are not? We're going to get there. It's right here in the eye. It's tough to... It's hard because of the way that some people were raised to embrace this fact. But if you are heedless, then the Qur'an will misguide you or you will be have an aversion to it. If you are heedless, the opposite is true. You will not enjoy the Qur'an, you will not desire it, you will not seek a relationship with it, you'll feel bothered by it. If you're heedless of your soul and of purpose, and if you're not a guidance seeker. If you're a cultural Muslim, meaning you're reading Qur'an because maybe it's Ramadan and everybody's expecting you to because this is what we're supposed to do in Ramadan as a custom, then you'll find, man, I really just don't know what I'm getting out of this, right? If you're a guidance seeker, you will start to come upon facts and realities from an innate, inherent mystical standpoint, from a divine legislation standpoint, from a history of facts of prophethood standpoint in comparison with other scriptures, uh, from a scientific standpoint. You'll see some things mentioned that are clearly there's no way anyone before the last hundred years would have known about that, much less 1,400 years ago. Right? So you will see many aspects of why this is the truth from your Lord. You'll feel it inside, you'll see it around you. Right? This is the ayah from the end of Surah Al-Fussila. It says, we will show them our signs in themselves and in the world around them, in the horizon around them, until it becomes true that this is the truth to them. So this is what that's talking about. So uh, the believer is going to find that belief and they're going to have these foundations. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi So the believer has something called foundations. A lot of our young people and a lot of the grown Muslims feel like it's, religion is like something that you inherit. It is a cultural thing. And we have to respect our culture. 
So that's absolutely not what religion is. Religion is something overarching and superseding to culture. Culture is a human reality. Religion is a divine reality. So the divine must regulate the human, not vice versa. The human, when it starts to regulate the divine, that is where all the problems you see with the Ummah right now. Is that people are using religion for their own interests, and it's when it's convenient, and they challenge things with whatever people are assuming and thinking is real and true, when that's a divine revelation. And the reason why they're doing this is because for many Muslims, they're confused with the problem that Jews and Christians have with their scripture and their religion. So it is, a, it is an anthropological historical fact that the scholars who have studied vastly the Bible can say there's many holes and errors in the transmission and collection of this book and for sure the book never named itself nor did any real believer in the religion of Christianity or Judaism say God commanded this book directly to a prophet to be gathered. Rather the first five of the Old Testament are the Torah and even they're going to admit that there's all kind of holes and errors in that. And then these are some other many different prophetic books. And then how the, the Christian community decided Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they canceled out all these others. And why Paul, some guy who actually never met Jesus in person, but through many dreams, mm -hmm. claims he was made the 13th mystical apostle, and he's the one that wrote over three quarters of the actual New Testament of the Bible, which is Jesus' gospel, as, as it were. So there's all kind of problems with that. So they're ready and willing to compromise their beliefs and question things in there because it's not a reliable book. You see? And so for us, if you start thinking that as a Muslim, you really haven't studied something called Ulum al-Qur'an. The sciences of the Qur'an, the history of it, where it came from, how it was collected, what are the miracles about it, how it's understood, the hand-me-down of commentary and all these detailed things about it. So the foundations will set you. So, Will people read the Qur'an, deep believers, people who are devoted to Islam, will they read the Qur'an and say, ah, that sounds weird to me. I'm having a hard time with this. Will people do that? Of course. We're human beings. We have our own brain. It's shaqqad. We have shaitan. We have it. So we're always going to go through it and have a da'wah and have some fitna in our religion. Right? But you go back to the foundations. Where did this book come from? The person it was sent to, was he prophesied? Did he do miracles? What kind of character did he have? Did he truly exemplify the model that he was teaching? Did other people confirm? Has his religion grown? What has it done for societies that truly understood and embraced it? What has it done for the history of mankind? Right? When you study all these foundations of the message into whom it was sent, which is our shahada, that's where it comes from, then you will know that Whatever doubts and questions I'm having, okay, are coming from me. So that's where we go right into the next part. Because, As for the disbelievers, they will listen to the Qur'an and listen to what it's teaching and its parables and lessons and say, what would God want with saying something like that? That's how their response is. It's a very selfish, egotistical, rational argument against it without really even assessing the foundations from where it's sent. So their mind is being put over this possible revelation of God. Let's just put it like that. We should always be objective. Like I'm a, Obviously, I'm a believer and I've come to this faith and belief and security and what I know based upon a deep research of the foundations that make it true. Not just because it sounded right or I met some nice guy who was Muslim or whatever, right? So um, the disbeliever is going to start like that. So um, they will dismiss it and they won't even look for the evidence or the foundations, right? But the believer will find the foundations and then what will we do? Da'ma yuribuk ila ma'la yuribuk. This is one of the 40 hadith that the scholars have agreed is. Standard. Some of them said it's the top five. Leave that which gives you doubt for that which doesn't give you doubt. Here's what I've found. I'll be reading a tafsir of an ayah we were doing it in the sister's circle. Right? Just last week. Or it was two weeks ago. And the sister was asking about al-hurru bil hurri wal abdu bil abdi. And I have heard a basic, and it's been a while since I've studied that ayah. I remember when we studied something called jinayat. The law of qisas and all of that. 
It's been many, many years because as an American Muslim, the capital punishment rule of Islam doesn't really make much of a... It's, it doesn't mean anything here, right? Why would I need to know that in my daily life or in my discussion with people? But now with all this anti-Islam thing and so forth, it's happening, right? So <coughs> I read three different assessments of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that are very popular among schools of thought on this ayah. Two of them, I'm not comfortable with them. Why am I not comfortable with them? Really from my general understanding of the religion and the nature of God and prophethood and justice and all that, I could not... I could not uh, I couldn't become comfortable. I couldn't read an Arabic word, Mama. I couldn't become comfortable with those two. But one of them made perfect sense to me, and so I'm starting to follow that one because that makes sense within the religion, right? See, some people when they hear what I'm saying, they'll think, "Oh, this guy's bringing up this uh, play with the religion on your desires type thing." No, if you're a devout Muslim. You are the light of the revelation and your desire to know it and to know God, to know prophethood. That's what drives you. That's what's at the center of your life. So when, you're, when you've done that and you've committed yourself to it as Abdullah, as the servant of God, then you're going to come to a, a conclusion about certain things in the religion. So if you feel within the tradition, there's an understanding. And here's what I found. I have yet to find any eye of the Qur'an that when it, you know, some people have this thing in their mind that they need to be philosophical about the unseen. Leave the unseen to the, it's unseen. It's unperceived, meaning it's not in your uh, realm. You can't understand the nature of God in some, number one, it's arrogant to assume that my little speck of dust of a mind is going to wrap itself around the absolute divine truth of perfection when I am a finite, flawed being that only knows finite, flawed realities. Right? So just leave all that. But when it comes to law and the general purpose of faith and law and directive, I found that every single thing I study well, when I have a doubt, I will come to some great scholar who explained it for me and it makes perfect sense. And that is the beauty of our history is that the believers, they will come to know it's true. So guess what? Do you think that some of those scholars, why they differed is for the same reason? Yes. Did God intend for this revelation to be some rigid uh, constant or should it be a static uh, fluctuating richness that can deal with time, place, circumstances to guide all people at all places? It was intended to be the latter. And you see that through the books of law. As you're reading through the books of fiqh, you'll see this one said that, this one said this, he understood the same ayah this way and that way, this one understood the same hadith, because we have this and it's connected. Here's a big problem with some of our neighbors, is that you'll see you, so-and-so will open up his Bible, and he'll start up the new church. And then he'll start calling himself bishop. He went from priest to bishop, now he's bishop so-and-so. Like, oh, how, what is that? He's like, well, you know, I've read this thing a lot, and I've been preaching, and I feel like, you know, I'm a bishop now. We have connectivity. We're Ummat al-Isnad. We are a nation of connected knowledge. Why? Because the believers, they were adamant about studying and handing down what they understood to each other. Um, the parable of the angels appointed over the hellfire, you know that famous one about Tisata Asha, right? So some people in Mecca, in Mecca when they heard Surah Al-Muddathir, they said, why 19? Right? And now you got some strange Muslims in the modern age, the miracle of the 19 in the Quran. And if you read it, it goes overboard. This thing is overboard. It's something strange, ideas that come to... Yeah, Allah. Why don't we just say, We know that's what he said. It's 19. It came in the Qur'an. There's never been any debate about the Qur'an's authenticity because of absolute transmission, broadness and vastness, accessibility, like no other text in the history of mankind. Big time. Every mosque you go in, anywhere in the world, every salah you enter, you're going to be here now. Every Ramadan, in any place, in any village, they're finishing the whole Qur'an every year since the time of Umar radiya Allah. Right? How are you going to miss the Qur'an? And that, I mean, I'll be leaving the salah one day, one brother who, he maybe memorizes three parts of the Qur'an. But he's heard that particular part many times, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I'll go to that one, some other brother. This one's from Pakistan, that one's from Arabia, this one's from Turkey. That's how it is, our ummah, it's, this is the foundations, right? The difference between believers and disbelievers. Now here it comes, are you ready? 
So they asked, what does God want with this parable? يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ He leads astray by it. What is it? It could mean two things. The majority said a parable. Some scholars said the Qur'an itself. Are you ready for this? يُضِلُّ بِهِ He's misguiding with it, the Qur'an. Some people go back to where we uh, started. Huda lil muttaqin fa huwa dalalan lil ghafilin. This is what it is. It's mafhum al mukhalafa. So people will look into the Quran with a heart of disbelief and uh, uh, assumption that it's wrong or false or evil, and they will read that into everything they get. And it will be inside in them whatever it is that their heart inclines to. Because that's the nature of Allah. When He says, "Yahdi ma yasha wa yudillu ma yasha," well, I hear, I have heard too many times, and it almost makes me sick, and I get very annoyed when I hear some khatib or some brother talking about it like some haphazard puppeteer thing. It's like he chose those people for this, he chose those people for that. Hold on, are you telling me that God just decided haphazardly? I'm going to create this one to guide them and put them in heaven. For because I chose them and I'm gonna love them. I created those people just so I can put them in hellfire and torture them for eternity. Anyone of you gonna believe that? But you've heard it in a khutbah. You have heard it from some brother talking like that. I was in Boston one time. Subhanallah, it's a very. Uh, I, I don't know if I told this story here, but uh, uh, I was giving a you know seminar thing and uh, at the Ella Collins Institute. And uh, this uh, Saudi guy, he came up to me, he's studying over there at the college in Boston. And he says, SubhanAllah, Ya Khi Wallahi, uh, you know, I never knew I would meet an American who's studying Sharia and teaching Sharia. And I was like, why? He was like, we were taught back over in Saudi that Allah has created our country for the believers that He loves. That's why He created it. And He created the West for all of the evil fasiqeen and the kuffar. Because that's those. That's what their. That's their maqar. That's their place. That's he. He created those for Nara and those for heaven. And I was like, Well, Akhi, that's very strange. How are they teaching you that? He was like, I don't know. That's how I remember it. Now, whether that was the official curriculum or not, that's what he understood. So somebody's got some issues, right? So what it is is he's guiding you based upon your reality. This is the methodology. When people deviate. They choose to deviate. They choose to uh, seek their own desires. Then he will make their heart inclined to that. He will make that path easy for them. The one who is trying to seek guidance and goodness and all of that, he will make that one easy for them. The one who is uh, rejecting and wants to follow this guidance, he will make that easy for them. That's, a, that's why he says, Kulun khuliqa lima yusra Allah. Some people misunderstand the taqtib, or the order of this statement, that uh, you were created for what is it made easier for you. Well, what, why was it made easier for you? It is because the famous ayah is saying, as a result of their deviating, God caused their hearts to deviate. So, uh, that's what the scholar said about, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنذَرْتُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ what, Who did kafaru? What is that? It's a past tense verb for plural. Meaning they have chosen dis they've chosen disbelief, right? So then it says, "Khatam Allahu ala kulubim wa ala telling you what happened as a result of that. So if they change their heart, if their heart says, "I need to look for truth," God, are you there? I need you guide me. Guess what will happen? The veil will be lifted, and they'll start to see the evidence, and then they will be guided, and it, they will move towards it. Um, there's a famous there's a term, fasiqeen. You know what fasiq means? al kharij al ta'a The rebellious one. The one who is not obeying. But it's also the one who causes harm and corruption. There's a famous hadith. خَمْسُ وَفَوَاسِقْ يَقْتُلْنَ فِي الْحَلِّ وَالْحَرَمْ الْغَرَابُ الْحَدْعَى وَالْعَقْرَبُ وَالْفَأْرَى وَالْكَلْبِ الْعَقُورِ So the Prophet ﷺ said there are five harmful beings that should be killed, whether it's in Mecca or elsewhere. And that is... The crow and these uh, 
like the vultures and the scorpions and the rats and the uh, vicious like rabid dogs, right? So he's talking about the type of being. So if you look, all of these kind of come from a category. Well, in that same category, there's good, nice things that are, you're comfortable with and you would never kill them because they're not causing a problem, right? So the people who cause problems. So their sinful de defiance is how they're misled. So when somebody decides, I want to follow my desires. I want what I want. So arrogance and selfishness, um, those two will lead somebody to be sinful rebels. So, then it describes what is the fasiq. الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِهِ The sinful, rebellious ones are those who break their covenant with God after committing to it. So this is where it's very important to understand nuance because some people want to judge people and permanently put a label on them. You know Muslims that were Muslim, like... Let me just give you one good example. If you're on social media and you're a Muslim living in the real world right now, there's a big discussion about a famous Muslim yeah. who has seemed to have you know, done some things that aren't good. And the evidence is not in his favor. Now, should we judge him permanently and say we reject all the knowledge that he came with and permanently condemn him? No. He's a human being like everybody else. And the guy was not known to be some great Muslim scholar. He was a great preacher and a scholar of the Arabic language, mashallah. Um, but it doesn't ruin our religion, right? And we hope for everybody to come back to their religion. So, breaking their covenant with God after committing to it, what that refers to is, you're like, I'm a Muslim, I'm living and I'm following this message, I'm devout to it. So, for example, now, they stopped praying for some time. Or, they started drinking. It was very confusing to me one time. My wife said, can you come look at this on Facebook? And I said, okay. And some sister that I have known from before, from years before, she was a convert. She's on Facebook, and her thing still says she's Muslim. But she's putting a picture of her friends drinking beer at a bar. So I thought, well, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the non-alcoholic beer, and for some strange reason, she's okay with being at the bar. She said, no, read the caption." having some beers with my friends, right? So she was like, what do I do? And I was like, you should private message her. She was like, I shouldn't comment because it's happening in public and all that. I said, even though it's happening in public, it's better just to try to touch someone's heart privately in something that... So, you know, she sent her a message and then she was like, we all have sins and I'm not getting drunk, you know? So she's formulated her own understanding of the religion there. And so, uh, so this is where we have to be very careful that we know where is the red line. Because you have these attitudes that are being pr pr promoted here in the West of free thinking, um, uh, good heartness, what I call it. I have a good heart. I mean good. And so I'll do like this. Well, but here's the thing, is that we have these foundations in the prophethood and the legacy. And then people say, who are those old people from a long time ago across the world to tell me what is my religion all about? And so that's really, they just don't understand our history. And they're confusing. Guess what's happening right now? You have to understand the multifaceted attack we are under right now. So people are confusing. ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, with what it means to be a devout Muslim truly following the original Qur'an and Sunnah. Many people think that's what it's going to amount to. And they were told that. And guess who mostly told that story? Liberals. Now what's interesting is, these people are trying to fit in with them. You see what I'm saying? So here's where we go back to the beginning. What was the beginning of the ayah we talked about today? Inna Allah la yastahi. Right? You should never be shy for pleasing people. Because, oh, I'm going to please people because I'm shy. Faith and truth is a matter of uncompromisable standard. They should never be broken, right? So, um, so when, the, when someone's an adult, and they're consciously following Islam, and then you see them starting to break, here's why it's so important to 
stay with the jama'ah. What does that mean? Some people think it means like a madhab or a school of thought. Or what it means is where the Muslims who are devout are based. So the Islamic center should be involved there. You should have Muslims that are your friends, that are the most closest. It doesn't mean you can't have non-Muslims for friends. That understanding of, of some people is absolutely against so many eyes of hadith. Uh, you would not keep people who are clearly not interested in following Islam, for whatever reason, as your main influential base. Because that's what's going to happen. You will start to think like them and want to be like them. Whether you like it or not, they will form your thought process. And then they will brainwash you that you have your own individual thought. No, you're just trying to be like one that you're living around. That's what you're doing. You're just going along with whatever's around you. So you have to put the right uh, boundaries around you. And the prayer, that's why the prayer is so uncompromisable. Because it puts Allah at the center of your life. It makes Him the most important thing. And that's why after that, it's seeking guidance, or at the same time, it's seeking guidance. Keep reviewing. Um, yes, Brother, you had a question. Yeah, uh, I have a question regarding this uh, Fasi Khun. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, as you just read an example like uh, about like the snake and spark and these kind of, uh, the people having this kind of nature or category uh, who are like Farsifun. And in another ayah I remember like from Quran, it says uh, like corruption or fitna is a bigger, uh, you know, sin than killing. So uh, if, if like it is not for human beings to be, you know, judgmental, then how does this ayah be in, like in our understanding? No, it's not our business to judge. Like, I can remember when I was a new Muslim, I was, some brother had me convinced that anybody who shaved their face is a fast man. Have you heard that one? Mm -hmm. That is absolutely false. No scholar who understands the religion would say such a thing. They're doing some minor sin, or they're, doing, uh, they're missing out on sunnah. It's one of those two, and there's no other. Right? So this is what the correct scholarly understanding is. Some people are... Because whoever would say about someone you're a disbeliever or you're a facet, that returns to them if it isn't, meaning it's a very serious charge. We should never put ourselves in. What we should be doing is, we should be worrying most importantly about ourselves and our close family, about this not entering our life. And then people who we know, the way we are, rather than to judge them and to you know sit and talk with others, and oh yeah, that one's doing like that and all that, rather we go and we try to you know, be a source of good, compassionate, encouraging motivation for, towards truth. That's how we would deal with this. Well, also the context in which Brother just uh, discussed was uh, people disturbing the um, peace in Masjid al-Haram and disrupting the, the, the environment around it. Well, what, what there was going back is people were being tortured uh, on their religion and there was a constant attack on Muslims as a result of their being Muslim and so there was a fear about to be Muslim. So some of these early wars was about establishing the right, the freedom for people to choose and follow Islam without disruption. So that's what, it's, that's what the tafsir of that ayah is. So uh, when, it's, when it's talking about fasiqeen, we'll see the examples because we're running into the, the isha, inshallah. So, mithaqihi uh, is the covenant, meaning to, to say the declaration of faith as an adult and you knowingly, consciously admit that. And then you're living like that and then you break free from it. So what is their definition? وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلُ They sever ties that were meant to be kept and they spread corruption in the land. So what are the ties that are meant to be kept? This is a very eloquent, what we call uh, kalam mujas. It's a very gem-packed small statement that carries a huge vast meaning to join that which was meant to be joined. What is the first thing? Obedience to God and His message. That's the first. The second one is your parents. To honor and respect your parents. To keep that tie. The third one is the immediate ties of the womb that you have, your aunts and your uncles and your brothers and your sisters. Okay, So those are very, very important to keep those ties. The next one is to uphold the laws of the land, 
that you live in. Um, whether they are formed by Islamic law in some clear ayah hadith, or whether it be just the understanding of the uh, place that this is the rules and boundaries that we have. As a citizen, as someone who would live there, you have to keep joined that which was meant to keep joined. The next one is to respect the authority. So if a police officer comes to you, you know, I saw this thing, somebody was posting it on the internet, and uh, so what happened with some sisters on a plane? People are posting it in the wrong way because they're trying to make it out to be the vic We need to not play the victim card so much, guys, because it's not working in our best interest. So they post a picture of the police picking up Muslim sister and ripping her out of her seat, taking her off the plane. I read the whole story in the Los Angeles Times, and what happened was she was bothered by two dogs that were on the plane, and she openly yelled to the, the whole plane that I have a life-threatening uh, allergy to dogs. Okay, So then a her lady came and said, can I help you? She said, these dogs should get off the plane because I'm, you know, having a problem with them. And then the stewardess uh, uh, made clear to her that, in fact, the people who own those dogs, one is a helper dog, like a blind person or whatever, and then the other one is an approved small pet that's in its thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have sold them their tickets with this knowledge. She said, well, you should have informed me that that was there. And she said, to, to our knowledge, you are far from them. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't, I mean, if it was next to you, we could find a place, you know. And then she said, this is ridiculous. So then they went to the captain. The captain, who is what? He's the authority of this place. Mm -hmm. That's, he's the captain of the plane. He said, the lady's going to have to get off and take another plane because she's the one in danger mm -hmm. and we don't want to put her, we don't want to be on the plane and then the, the, something happened and you know, yeah. so and that's the best solution. We cannot tell these two people, Thank right? You. Yeah. So then she didn't want to get off the plane. So then the police came on and ripped her off. If she would just been following this ayah, we would not have this problem, right? But yet the thing is being posted by all the Muslims as, look at the crazy anti-Islam American government. And what they're doing to us. And this is a false uh, captioning, man. Another one is uh, responsible in business dealings. You have to fulfill the rights of owner and buyer and renter. You have to, th any business deal, there is a certain thing that should be right. So you have to, what was, so keeping somebody secret. When somebody comes to you in confidence, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا حَدَّثَ أَحَدٌ أَحَدًا ثُمَّ الْتَفَتْ فَهُوَ أَمَانًا If somebody's talking to you, or there was a, a known general meeting that is not an open public discussion like we're having now, and that was meant to be kept like that, you should assume it is kept like that if it's just a small group, or in a house, or between two people, and not tell anybody their, the private discussion. Because that was meant to be joined. Uh, and the last one is taking care of the weak, the orphans, the poor, and all of those. We are meant to take care of them like they're our family. Yeah. So then it says, You will know those who have broken their covenant with God, they will spread corruption on the earth. Um, so what is that? They have selfish desires. They will oppress others. They will take their rights unjustly. They will resort to violence. They will accept destruction, right? Um, so like when we look at about a lot of the policies we've got now as an American uh, system, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that, and you know what's interesting? These general concepts we're talking about are very biblical. We can join with our neighbors, Jews, Christians, and oh, even the uh, atheist humanists will join us on this. Say, yeah, look at all this corruption and oppression and standardized violence and and, and, you know, like right now, the guy shot all those people in Las Vegas, and it's like, well, he's just some guy. If he were black or Muslim, that would not be how we're dealing with that. You see what I'm saying? We all know this. So there is an issue about white privilege and white supremacy that is intrinsically ingrained in this society. And it's based upon a certain arrogance and selfishness of the people who have the most power. So then it says, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ those are the failures. Those who have lost, they're the losers. Um, so what does that mean? 
that they've lost in the, uh, the reality of life. So believers are those that have a firm bond with revelation, which will do what to you? It will do the opposite of all of this. If you truly, that's where we can say, like if somebody said, tell me why ISIS is not following his life. Okay, here, I'll give you the 27th uh, verse of the Quran, 26, 27. Somebody might look at it and say, what does that have to do with anything? No. These things that you're seeing where they're, يَقْطَعُونَ مَا عَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Okay, that's the, that is the calling card. That is the MO of ISIS. They are destroying and breaking all good ties and establishing all kind of corruption and all of that. So clearly they're not believers. Clearly they don't have the covenant of God in their mind because look what they're doing. This is the beginning of the Quran to tell you that. Right? We don't need to go into some detailed analysis of the ayat, jihad, and qital to come to this conclusion. So true success is what? Who knows the famous... Uh, so this is, says those are the losers. The Qur'an has one little small formula. In some narration of the Sahaba's meeting said that they would never meet and leave a meeting except for they would recite this surah. Surah Al-Asr. There is four qualities of those who will succeed. Amalu, meaning, alimu fasaddaqu. This is Ibn Qayyim. He said, faith is not some blind thing. You study the foundations of God and revelation and prophethood. And then you affirm and ratify the truth of it. So then you act accordingly. You live by it. And if you're living by it, now you are authorized to properly teach it to others. Tawasa al haq so you advise each other, meaning Tawaso is a two-way street, meaning you accept advice and truth when it comes to you and you're giving it to others. And then last, you know that this is not an easy task. It takes patience and fortitude, perseverance, uh, forbearance, sabr, that they are helping each other in that. Those are the four qualities of the believers who will be the opposite of those who are breaking the ties that are meant to bond and help a, establish a healthy uh, well-unified, well-good society and that has no corruption and, and tyranny and things like that. So the Qur'an has the opposite model of that in those four uh, things. So inshallah, now I think it's time for Aisha. Is there any quick questions anybody had on this one? Zakumullah khairan, subhanakullahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah.